In the opening scene, we are introduced to a man named Aaron who is standing on the rooftop of a building with a cigarette in his hand. He appears to be extremely frustrated and restless. He tries to contact his wife but does not receive any response from her. It turns out that she is already dead in her apartment. Aaron then leaves a voicemail expressing his frustration. He repeatedly says, we could have done it together. Soon after, he gets overwhelmed by his anxiety and commits the unthinkable. Clearly, they did not do it together. In the next scene, we meet Liv, a young woman living with her boyfriend, Hamming. She is currently in the middle of a conversation with her mother, who urges her to come back home as soon as possible. After hanging up the call, Liv starts packing her belongings and is on the verge of leaving. A few moments later, Hamming wakes up and inquires about the matter. Liv says that she's fed up with him, as he is always busy with work. Hamming tries to reassure her, but their conversation takes a dark turn when he reveals that one of his his clients committed the unthinkable just because he took a work break in order to spend time with her. It turns out that he's talking about Aaron. Feeling that Hamming prioritizes work over their relationship, Liv feels disheartened and storms off. We also learn that a mysterious virus is affecting people worldwide, leading to severe mental disturbances and instability. Some experts claim that the virus induces a phenomenon known as involution, essentially causing individuals to regress. It means the people are eventually turning back into primitive states of mankind. According to a professor, the human species are losing their frontoparietal lobes, which are responsible for associative and analytic behavior. Due to this, human emotions are being affected and the symptoms are heightened irritability, quick temper, aggression, shouting slurs in Fortnite lobbies, and so on. In order to provide support to such people, the government has created an online platform called the Companion System. Several staff are recruited to handle the clients via companion companion system, and Hamming is one of them. He currently feels very guilty over Aaron's tragic demise, as he was responsible for taking care of him. What makes this even more heart-wrenching for Hamming is the fact that Aaron was his first client. Hamming should probably be fired. The scene then shifts to 100 days prior, where we see Hamming talking with Aaron. Through Aaron's voice, it is clear that he is frustrated, but Hamming somehow manages to persuade him to take his medication timely and calm down. Shortly after the session, Hamming Hamming is scheduled to conduct another one with a client named Kane Sardo. As soon as the session begins, Kane starts to vent his frustration, confessing that he threw away his medicines. He even admits that he killed someone in the street who was blocking his way. In addition to this, Kane passes some mean remarks towards Hamming and tells him that his therapy sessions aren't helping him at all. Regardless, Hamming tries to console him, but the client refuses to listen and leaves the session abruptly, probably to go kill again. Hamming should definitely be fired. A few days pass by, and Kane's mental state continues to deteriorate. On a particular day, while in the midst of a bath, he receives a visit from his friend named Ian. Kane initially addresses him in an aggressive manner, but his behavior shifts to the light upon learning that Ian has brought with him some narcotics. Wasting no time, Kane consumes these drugs, which provides him with a sense of momentary satisfaction. However, they are interrupted by a knock at the door, and to their terror, Popo coming! It's the police. In a state of panic, the two friends manage to evade the apartment just before the police break in. Later on, Kane believes that Hamming is the one responsible for alerting the authorities. However, he knows nothing about Hamming, due to which he is unable to locate him. 80 days ago from the present day, Liv became one of Hamming's clients via the companion system. Over time, their therapeutic sessions eventually turned into a close bond of friendship. One day, the two decide to meet in person, which was against the rules of the companion system. In this this way, their connection blossomed into a romantic relationship. However, their love has now started to suffer, marked by constant arguments that hurt each other's feelings. Back in the present, Liv reaches her home, but she is unable to unlock the door with her fingerprint. After several failed attempts, she resorts to her signature and eventually gains access. Upon entering, she is welcomed by her mother and her new boyfriend. Later, while having some food, Liv's mother shares her intention to sell the house. She now wants to relocate to a better place with her partner. Liv vehemently opposes this decision as the house holds the memories of her late biological father. Hence, she refuses to sign any documents. But, unbeknownst to Liv, her earlier signature on the entrance door allows them to proceed without her consent. When Liv gets to know of this,
this, she gets so angry that she grabs a fork and stabs her mom's boyfriend. Stepdads are never cool. She's just getting a head start. On the other hand, Hamming continues his attempt to call Liv, but he is unable to reach her. Concerned, he contacts the police to report her as missing, only to learn that they can initiate the investigation only after five days from the moment the person went missing. Left with no other choice, Hamming takes matters into his own hands. He uses her companion system identification number to trace her location and ventures towards the same. Sadly, his long absence from using cab services has led to his membership account's expiration. God, this view of the future is freaking me out. As a result of this, Hamming has no other choice but to walk. On his way, he approaches a random guy and requests for a ride to the subway station. Believing that he is some kind of thug, the guy pulls his gun on Hamming, prompting him to retreat in haste. After several hours of walking, Hamming arrives at the subway station, where he stumbles upon an injured man lying on the ground. Concerned, he approaches the guy and proceeds to call 911 for medical assistance. However, Hamming is unexpectedly attacked by an unknown assailant from behind, knocking him out. A short while later, he regains his consciousness, only to discover that the injured man has stolen all of his belongings, including his backpack, identification cards, and even his shoes. Despite this setback, Hamming manages to get back on his feet and boards a subway train to continue his journey. In the next scene, we see Kane venting his aggression by beating up a person. Coincidentally, the person happens to be the same guy who robbed Hamming. Kane and Ian inspect Hamming's backpack and come across his identification card. Kane immediately recognizes him and becomes overjoyed at having found his target. They also access Hamming's device and determine where he is heading to. Without any delay, the duo rushes to the subway station, but they narrowly miss the departing train by a few seconds. This infuriates Kane, so he berates Ian, blaming him for being too slow. Upon learning that the next train won't arrive for another 25 minutes, they devise an alternative plan. They steal a car from a woman and speed away. On their way, Ian questions whether he is sure that Hamming was the one who alerted the police. In response, Kane asserts that it must be either Hamming or Ian himself. Meanwhile, Hamming falls asleep on the train and dreams of himself being stranded in a desolate landscape. As he approaches a mysterious entity in the middle of the land, he abruptly snaps out from the dream. After getting off the train, Hamming resumes the rest of his journey on foot. He makes several attempts to hitchhike, but to no avail. While walking along the highway, he comes across a group of local gangsters robbing an innocent woman. However, this time, Hamming chooses not to get involved in it, so he swiftly moves away from the scene. On the other hand, Kane and Ian find a young girl seated in the back seat of the car. She happens to be the daughter of the same woman whose car they've stolen. This freaks Kane out, but Ian manages to maintain his composure and begins talking to the child. They introduce themselves, though Kane insists that Ian should not reveal their true identities. When the latter disagrees, they get into a heated argument and end up crashing the car. Are you kidding me? Fortunately, all of them survive with minor injuries. Kane drags himself out of the crash vehicle, but Ian takes a moment to choke the girl to death, okay, making it appear as an accidental death. Following this chilling act, the two of them continue their journey on foot. Elsewhere, Hamming finally reaches his destination and knocks on one of the house doors within the community. An old lady answers the door, and Hamming inquires about Liv's residence. In response, the old lady directs him towards the house near the woods. Later on, this elderly woman retrieves some food from the kitchen and enters a room where she has tied up a young girl in chains. She throws the food to the captive girl, Gretel, who devours it. The young girl behaves unusually, presumably because she is also affected by the mysterious virus. A short time later, Hamming arrives at Liv's residence and finds the door open. He walks into the house, only to witness the lifeless body of Liv's mother and her boyfriend lying on the floor. Terrified, he feels uneasy and collapses on the ground. In this subconscious state, he experiences a nightmarish vision where Liv is mercilessly feeding upon his flesh. The following morning, Hamming wakes up, overcome by shivers. He proceeds to get some food from the refrigerator and digs into it, appearing as if he has been hungry for days. His behavior indicates that the virus is slowly overcoming him as well. Amidst this, he hears someone entering the house, and as a result, he quickly hides himself behind a couch. The intruders turn out to be none other than Kane and Ian, who are there in search of Hamming. Kane proceeds to search the entire house, while Ian begins to play with a rope in the swimming pool. After a while, Kane gradually approaches the couch, but Hamming somehow manages to crawl away and hide beneath the kitchen sink. Shortly after, Kane walks in 
into the kitchen, but he is unable to stand the rotten smell from the dead bodies, prompting him to leave. In the next scene, Hemming walks out and ventures towards the woods in search of Liv. After a while, he finally locates her, but she is already infected by the virus. Liv is behaving in a primal manner and feeding on raw flesh. Hamming slowly approaches her and manages to soothe her agitated state. He says he'll just change his name to Hammer and they can be cannibals together. He then takes out his jacket and covers her body with it. In the midst of this, he also reminisces about the joyful moments they shared in the past. Not long after, Kane and Ian spot the couple and launch an immediate attack on them. Kane goes after Hamming, whereas Ian uses the rope to drag Liv by her neck. During the commotion, Hamming grabs a stone and strikes it hard on Kane's head. He then positions himself above Kane and delivers a series of forceful blows, ultimately killing him. Following this, Hamming quickly rushes to Liv's rescue. Seeing him, Ian makes the escape, but by that time, Liv is no longer alive. This heartbreaking loss shatters Hamming, prompting him to break down in tears. With great sorrow, he carries Liv to an open field, where he lays down beside her. He holds her hand and eventually breathes his last breath. As the time lapses, the remains of the couple gradually decomposes, transforming into skeletal remains. Subscribe for more videos like this, turn on notifications, and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.